high schoolers, so now I get to take, uh, take uh, some time in South Portland High School. I'm really excited. So I'm going to talk mostly about food waste, but I love talking about recycling and trash too. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about that. So EcoMate is a company that has a single store recycling facility. Which means that everything you put in the recycling bin comes to us and we sort it for you. And everything you put in the trash bin comes to us and we burn it, turn it into electricity, and vastly reduce it in size, make it into ash, and then put that in the ash field. So do you guys know where your trash and recycling ended up? It goes to right by the airport and it comes to us. We also have a landfill that we um, open and we process and we, we have. So we have three facilities. And in spring or um, September of 2016, we started food waste. Uh, we just we found out that between 20 and 30 percent of everything that was in the trash can was actually food or organics, and we did a feasibility study to find that out, and we found that that was like the new frontier of how to convert more and more from the trash. Um, you know, we've got reduce, we've got reuse, we've got recycle, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But you know, food waste was really something big that we could pull out and do something great with instead of burning it. Because I don't know if you know this, but food waste. Most of it is water, it's moisture. When you burn moisture, it's not all that helpful, right? It's not making high BTUs. The electricity that's made off of that is just not that great, it's not that much. So to get that food waste, to get the organics out of the trash can was an incredible thing, really a twofer because we got um, good resources out of it, which Greg and I will talk about, and we got better, uh, um, better making electricity, better uh, burning. So I do want to point out that we have uh, about 74 towns currently we're in the process of signing on a couple more. South Portland is only one of them, but we have about 400,000 people whose stuff comes to us. So it's not just South Portland, but it's 400,000 people. So that's why it's really important to talk about this hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle, compost, or anaerobic digestion, then waste energy and landfill. Everything that you do ends up somewhere. It doesn't just disappear. Someone else has to deal with it. So the best thing that you can do with, with, with whatever object you have, the best that will it will turn into. So try and reduce as much as possible. And by that I mean use less of stuff. But we all need to use things. We all need to eat things. We all need to have things. So then can you reuse whatever that is? Whether it's a pair of shoes you've grown out of that you don't like anymore. Whether it's a shopping bag that you take to the grocery store over and over. Or it's just that one water bottle that you fill all the time. There's lots of ways to reuse things. And then can you recycle it? Is it made out of paper, plastic, metal, glass, or cardboard? All these things can be turned into brand new things. A new milk jug. South Portland has Willard Beach, a great playground. Come on in, guys. Don't be scared. Um, South Portland and Willard Beach has a really great playground, only made out of recycled material. So if people in the past had to recycle all these objects, they would not have had this playground that lots of kids go to play on uh, every single day. So uh, recycling is a huge thing. It takes a lot out of the trash bin and makes sure that it gets turned into something new. And then can you compost it? Is it made out of some sort of organic material? I like to say, if it comes from the earth, can it go back to the earth? Uh, this is everything from your napkins, your Kleenexes, your orange peels, your apple cores, bananas, leftover sandwich, um, half of that, you know, piece of cake you dropped on the ground, you know, whatever you don't want to eat or can't eat, can be composted or anaerobically digested. And the next, the second one we'll talk about if you don't know what that is yet. And then we're super lucky to have a waste to energy facility where you live. Most places have a full trash landfill. I'll show you a picture of that in a second, which the, pile, the, the trash just piled up and piled up and it's just a big, ugly pile of trash. Here in Maine, and specifically in the Portland area, we have our waste to energy building. And waste to energy means trash to electricity. We burn the trash, make it much less, turn into electricity along the way. This is just a super confusing kind of pie graph thing, but I did want to show you that we have um, about 43, 42, 43,000 tons of recycling that came to us last year. 6% of that was the food waste that we were pulling out. Now 6% doesn't seem like a lot, but look right next to it where it says glass was 5% of everything we get. Food waste is very heavy. If we're able to pull that out, your town saves a lot of money on their trash hauling. So not only is it good for saving money on the trash hauling and saving money for the town and your school, of course, but it also is more helpful for us because we get to burn better and make more electricity, and it pulls it out to make a brand new resource. So it's kind of win-win-win 
all the way. Also, if you look for about a 4%, that is all the classics combined. So number one, number two, and number three through seven was about 4%. If you think about how much plastic you make, multiply that by our 400,000 people, we still generated uh, more food waste than that 4% and that 5%. We generated 6% of that entire ton of this food waste. So we, we're doing a really great job, and you're helping us out by pulling that food waste out of your trash can. So how did we first come about doing this? Uh, was our uh, municipal pilot. The picture on the left is Julie Rosenbach. That is your sustainability coordinator for South Portland. She's amazing. She had a big old pile on her plate today, so she could make it but she is fantastic. She's doing things for South Portland every single day to make sure you guys have clean air, clean water, everything is going well. Um, she's worked on styrofoam bands and bag fees and more than manual bands. Uh, the food waste pilot was um, a huge thing for her, so she's very excited about it. And of course, I can't not point out Carrie on the right. She's in Scarborough. Because what EcoMaine did was we uh, put together a pilot program of food waste. We wanted to take it out of the trash, we found South Portland and Scarborough and said, all right, we'll give you bins, we'll set you up with um, pickups, and these households are going to get it, and then you guys are going to be our, our testing mice, and you're going to put your food waste in here, and then it's going to come to us at the transfer station and then go up to Craig, and he'll talk about what happens to it up there. But one thing, a couple things that we know, this slide is really boring in that it has a lot of facts in it, but I didn't think I could remember it because I put it together last minute, but about a third of South Portland already goes back there composting. Does anyone here compost at their house in their backyard? Fantastic. So about a third of South Portland is already back there composting, and that's the best thing you can do with your food waste. Keep it local, right? Your backyard composting, you can put it on your own garden and grow something new for yourself. Another thing that's going on that's really great is about 800 households and about uh, 12 to 15 businesses, which doesn't really seem like a lot, but businesses, of course, generate a lot of stuff, are using uh, another pickup uh, business for compost. So we compost at a garbage to garbage. Have we all heard of those? Even if we don't use them, we might have heard of them. So what they're doing is they're picking up food waste, taking it to their facility, and turning it into compost, and that they either give it away or sell it or use it in the city, um, but it is turned into something really great to grow other things in. And then finally, our food waste pilot, which was started um, in the spring of 2017 here in, in South Portland, has done a really great job. Um, we've had a 37% participation rate, which means of the 600 homes that we said, hey, you guys are our, our testing area, 37% put their bucket out every week. I think that's pretty low. I would have loved to have seen a 100% participation rate, especially because we were giving those people a free way to reduce their amount of trash. But we were able to divert uh, 100,000 pounds, or 50 tons of food waste from the trash, and that was just with 222 homes. I did the math, it was 37% of 600 for you. So it's pretty exciting that uh, a lot of food waste has been diverted just with that small area. And that's on top of, of course, the, uh, the, the people that are doing backyard composting, and the people that are doing garbage to garden, and the businesses that are doing meat composting. So just a little baby summary of how it works. The city of South Portland used Garbage to Garden as their um, hauler. So there are people who use Garbage to Garden, that's one thing. And then Garbage to Garden was partnering with us to give us bins for people to put their food waste in in the pilot, and then that was brought to us. So Garbage to Garden normally was doing their own thing with composting over here, but then they had another side thing going on with our tour, or our um, pilot, in that they were bringing it to us, and then we sent it to, uh, with the help of AgriCycle, the hauler, to Exeter Ener uh, Agri Energy uh, up in Exeter, Maine. So Greg will tell you more about that, but I do have one fun thing to show you. We'll talk a lot about the, um, like, why to take out your food waste. Do you know what happens to your food waste when you toss it in the trash? I'm Katrina Denheisen. Environmental educator for EcoMain here to explain why recycling your food waste is not only wicked good, good for the environment, but also good for your community's piggy bank. I'm standing on the second level of EcoMain's seven story trash bunker, where approximately one third of Maine's trash comes to die. As your trail of showers and tons of garbage pass through this bunker every week on its way to be burned, which also creates electricity before then buried in our landfill as ash. 
But let's face it, burning tomatoes, yogurt, and orange peels and other wet food waste is much like pouring a can of tomato soup on the campfire. Not very effective. But food scraps are a valuable resource when recycled into fertilizer, animal bedding, or renewable power through anaerobic digestion. In September of 2016, EcoMe became a central collection point for food waste from some restaurants and supermarkets. Trucks collect food waste from the greater Portland area until there's enough to make a longer trek up to Stony Bell Farm, a family farm up in Exeter, Maine, where it then undergoes anaerobic digestion. We charge $70.50 for every ton of garbage processed here, and only $55 for every ton of food waste. Here's how anaerobic digestion works. So we've got here two 400,000 gallon digesters, and this is where the manure and food slurry are mixed together, and then broken down by those methane uh, bugs, the whole bacteria creatures. They're eating uh, the food and manure recipe, and they're creating gas. The gas is uh, pulled off, goes underground, and into the white um, machine building. That's where the generator is, and that's where it's generating electricity. With EcoMain's new Feed Me Food Scraps program, residents and participating communities can now recycle their food waste at the curb with their trash and recycling. So now let's go to yours. Throw food into your trash and into the forever tube of EcoMain's 274 acre landfill, or separate it into your food waste bin to make its way to the greener pastures of Stonyville Dairy Farm, and also to greener homes as a renewable energy source. That thing, that last thing you just saw in the background. Do you know what happened to your food waste when you toss it in the trash? Um, the last thing in the background there, that was the landfill where all of your trash ends up. And when we don't deal with our trash, if we don't deal with our food waste, if we don't deal with our recycling, we're going to look like this, which looks really fine, right? We need to take care of our stuff, make sure it goes in the right bin so it goes to the right place and goes to the highest use. Reduce, reuse, recycle, compost only then put it in the trash can. So I can't do anything, I can't do any kind of presentation without talking about recycling too, because getting the recycling out of your trash can is also incredibly important. That's all of your paper, all of your cardboard, your hard plastics like your containers, yogurt containers, ketchup containers, um, milk jugs, cereal, things like that, um, your glass and your metal. They are sorted in our facility uh, right by the Portland Airport. This is just one piece of our equipment. There are about 200 of these separating out your paper. Imagine what happens if we get something long or tangly. It gets stuck inside those stars. Our men have to get in there and clean it out. Um, there's other types of machines. There's humans working there. There's two types of magnets. There's this thing called an optical sorter that's looking for the chemical makeup of the plastics and only sees number one, just like your water bottle there. Um, so it's seeing that number one and blowing a puff of air and separating it that way. So the machines are very sensitive in their sorting abilities. When we get the wrong things in here, they get stuck. Uh, there are explosions, there's fires, things happen. It sounds really bad because sometimes it is. So we need your help to make sure you're only putting the right stuff in the bins. Um, there are lists online. We've created this brand new thing called the Recyclopedia. We all know what an encyclopedia is, right? We're not too young for that. So a Recyclopedia is our recycling encyclopedia. So it's a free download on your smartphone, or you can go on your website, and, uh, on our EcoMain website and find it. You can type in almost any object, and it will show you what to do with it, whether it's composting it, um, re reusing it, bringing it to a store, recycling it, or putting it in the trash. Because this is what happens when we don't deal with our trash and recycling in the old days before waste energy came out. This is Hashell Landville. A lot of places in the state and in the country still look like this. Um, but luckily we have a facility where we can burn it. I don't have time to go into it today, but this is the process of what happens to your trash. It comes in on a truck, the claw grabs it, brings it up to the sixth floor, and drops it into a hopper where it then leads to the boiler and burns for four hours. It's gradually turned into ash, goes on a conveyor belt under a magnet where any metal is taken up and into a truck. So we're taking your trash from 100% and reducing it down to 10% and then putting that in the landfill instead of putting this in the landfill each and every time, which I think is pretty fascinating. We're also making enough electricity to power between 10,000 and 15,000 homes uh, each year, and that's on top of powering most of our facilities. So we're self-powered from your and my trash, which I think is fantastic. And then of course we're also making pollution, but you're making pollution whether you're burning a campfire or a tire or a piece of gum. You're always making fumes and bad stuff. 
So we treat it at one, two, three, four, and test it at number five. So by the time it leaves the stack, it's 96% water vapor and a little bit of pollution, but our permits allow us to pollute at least twice as much as we actually do. So we're doing a pretty good job of dealing with your recycling and your trash uh, and some of your food, food waste, but we really need your help to put the right thing in the right bin. When you go to a trash can and you put your recycling in it, nothing ever happens to it. Nothing turn, uh, is, is turned into anything. When you put your trash in a recycling bin, you're making a huge mess for us because think about how many people we service and uh, extrapolate that, multiply that. So your trash can, minus your food waste, minus your recyclables, really does equal a healthy environment, a reduction of resources consumed to make new products, and less municipal dollars spent for disposal. Because trash costs this much, recycling costs this much, food waste costs this much. So why would we pay more to recycle and to put, to put recycling and trash in there? So with that, enjoy my comments. What kind of questions do you have? Yes? How often does you get those issues in machines? Every single day. These, I said 200 on top and 100 down below, and that's sorting out the paper. We have to stop the machine and lock it at least twice a day to cut out all the goo in between. This is dog leashes, plastic bags, tinsel from Christmas trees, Christmas lights, um, wires, chains, you name it, we get it. We even get chainsaws and snakes and weird things that we, we don't really want at all. We got a stunt one, so that was a lot. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, you may have said this already, but where is the trash burned? Right by the Portland Airport. Okay. You're going down the Congress, airport's here, you go up. Um, keep going right, that's or keep going straight, that's to the, the mall. But if you go up to the right, you pass Unum, you pass over 95. We're right there on Blueberry Road. Okay. So within a mile or so of the airport. Yep. yep. Okay. More questions? Yes? Yeah, vermicomposting. So you can absolutely compost inside if you have the right type of bin, and you can do that with worms, which I think is super fun. So you have one bin, and then there's another bin on the outside. There's a couple different ways, but I'll explain one. So the one bin on the inside, you drill holes in it, you put uh, shredded newspaper and some food waste, like let's say your carrot tops and your apple cores and things like that. You put in your worms, you uh, spritz it with water so they've got a nice, dark, cool, uh, moist environment. And then you put it under your sink or in a garage if it's not the middle of winter or the middle of summer. And the worms will eat the food waste and the paper. They'll make a liquid called, uh, you know, it's called composting tea, but it's really just wet stuff and you can put that on your plants as fertilizer, but they're also making a really nice soil called worm castings from their poop. But it's really fantastic. It's absolutely possible. More questions? Yes? Um, so I used to do backyard uh, composting like exclusively, but I recently started doing garbage to gardens. Yeah. And I was reading like what the stuff you could put into garbage to gardens was. Yes. And it, there was like a lot of stuff that I couldn't put into my backyard compost. Yes. Um, why is that? Great question. So you can put some things in, say, we compost through your garbage and garden or even agri-cycle that you can't do in backyard composting because of the animals and the smell and the temperature. So you've got to have the right temperature. You've got to have an enclosed area. So because say you put cheese in your backyard one, well, a raccoon or a mouse is going to come and eat that, right? You really don't want animals coming to your house because they could be vectors of, of disease or they just, you know, that's not their natural habitat and you want to make sure they're eating their own stuff. So it's really just a matter of you don't want to draw animals to your house and you also, you know, you don't want it to smell too bad. Um, plus if your compost is not hot enough, it's not going to be able to manage the meat and the cheese. Great question though. Anything else? Um, for, uh, yeah, just go for kind it. of follow up. How hot do the industrial composters get? That is a great question. How much how hot does that get? You can also make s'mores. I used to work at a, a facility, a, a kind of camp place where we put uh, chocolate and marshmallows inside of a bag and then that inside of another bag inside of another bag and then lifted up some compost and shoved it in there and like made a mark where it was. 
and then came back 10 or 20 minutes later, and it was all like gooey and mixed together, and then you put it on graham crackers and you eat it, it was so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, do you know if the city of South Portland is going to expand the pilot program? That's a great question. So the pilot, as of now, is extended to June. Um, and then after that, with any pilot, we find the good things and the bad things. We're not going to keep this going currently, but we are looking at another system, like they're doing in Scandinavia right now. They've got a bag of trash and a bag of food waste in the same bin, and then it's picked up on a truck and comes to their facility, and then they optically sort it, mm -hmm. which is really cool. I was going to put something in here, but I don't think I've enough time uh, to talk about it. So we're looking at that system, and that would make it easier for you. It would cost us, us a lot of money, but it would be easier you know, after that. No one would have to sort or, or dump or anything like that. So that's just another idea we're toying with. I don't want to take too much time from the other presenters, but please keep your questions if you have more, and I'd be really happy to answer them later on. Thank you. We actually even end up with 
uh, excess heat for the process that we then need to heat all the buildings we on the farm. Um, we're also looking at uh, co-locating some greenhouses where we can grow vegetables for um, some of our partners. Unlike garbage to garden, you know, we actually we, we uh, primarily focus on uh, commercial, you know, commercial businesses and colleges and other institutions. So Hanover is our new Hanover brand. Town is one of our partners. We work with all the Hanoverts actually in New England, um, as well as Walmart and some Whole Foods in Portland. A lot of the bigger uh, uh, generators is sort of what we focus on. We also got to have a six day a week um, group down in Boston, pretty spread out, and really focus on the big, big colleges and institutions. Uh, but we also love working with folks right here in town. So we work with a lot of restaurants right in South Portland as well as, well as Portland. Um, so we've got a number of trucks, we have roughly a dozen collection vehicles. They look like regular trash, truck, tra trash trucks. They're rear loaders and top loaders. Uh, we use totes, um, so you'll see those around throughout town. And we bring all that in the local area to Eco Main, where it's consolidated um, at the treatment facility. Um, Eco Main's been an awesome partner the last couple of years. Um, and then, you know, in any trucking business, some of you buddy entrepreneurs will know, if you get into trucking, you really need to maximize your efficiencies. And that means doing bigger loads. You want to go driving around with a little bucket and go 20 miles to go get it. So you want to we do 30 ton loads every time up to the facility from Eco Main. So we're really maximizing what we're doing for driving. Um, all that material goes up to Stony Bank, which is just outside of um, this is the new dome that we actually installed last fall. Um, those two domes that you saw earlier are 400,000 gallons each. This new one is 2.2 million, so it's quite a bit bigger. Um, have you seen that? No. All right, we're gonna, I know Kevin's seen it. Okay. Um, so it's really dramatically increased our capacity. Um, last year, we did between 40 and 50,000 tons of food leaves and waste that we collected from uh, commercial entities and colleges. Um, now with this new addition, you know, we can collect and process up to 100,000 tons a year. So it's really, we're really ready to um, continue working with more people. Um, basically the way it works, it's highly computerized, in, you know, uh, I use a big commercial composter, it's very low tech, it's crawling around the pile, it's getting dirty. This is a lot more high tech, computerized, um, you know, the big control room, the control panel, we have a smartphone that basically can control the whole system for miles away. Um, but essentially what it is, is you're creating a recipe just like cooking, and you're setting a temperature. Um, and what's sort of interesting about digestion is the run rate. We basically have uh, a run rate is essentially how often is that system operating. Uh, say, for example, like a wind farm might work 30 40 percent, or it's just really based on the wind. Digestion is what you set it at and, and the volumes that you're bringing in. So we're actually at a probably 90 to 95 percent run time. So we're just constantly going. Uh, typically, we do about 50 to 50 maneuver to food waste ratio. Uh, that's what tastes best and works best in the system. So, um, and it's a little cooler, like composting. Like to answer your question in the back, composting commercially can get pretty hot, but the digestion is a much cooler system. Uh, that's just an up close of one of the uh, uh, engines that we that we work with. Those, there's three of those now. They're based in essentially like a single wide trailer. Um, one of the things that we do with all of our partners is we have we created a calculator um, that lets them be able to express to their customers or their student bodies um, what they've done. Because digestion is a little bit, you know, it's one of those terms that no one really knows. Um, so if you want to be able to put your finger on it and say, this is the benefit of what we've been um, doing this past year, say, for example. So one of the real benefits of digestion is the you know, greenhouse gas destruction capabilities. It's all on the other side, so we're combusting that. And none of those greenhouse gases are getting released. Maybe um, what might happen in the landfill or even in the composting operation. Um, so there's real benefits on the environmental climate side. Um, and we want to convey that to everyone that we work with so they can share their story. Um, these are just the 
just a picture of the two byproducts, essentially. So that's the one on the left is the bedding. Um, you know, it's interesting, like digestion is a lot newer in the United States compared to, say, Germany and other parts of Europe where they've been doing it for years and years. Um, it's gotten so sophisticated over in Europe that there are actually PhD students doing studies on the performance of dairy cows using digestate, which is what's on the left there, versus, say, sawdust or wood shavings. It's gotten very mature over there as an industry. Here, you know, it's still growing. You know, we were really one of the only ones of our kind in New England where we could take food waste in addition to this manure. Um, a lot of dairy farms around the U.S. Uh, they have digesters, but they're really only meant to, to handle uh, manure from their cows. Um, that's part of the environmental management plan that they have to have for their states. On the left or on the right is one of the manure lagoons. Between the two that we have on site, we have about eight million gallons of capacity. And we need all of it basically because there's so much of this liquid byproduct that's coming out of the process that we um, that we need all of that. We basically take just regular back trucks and we go around and we spread that material on the farms and it helps form the farmlands. And we use that to grow feed crops for the cows. And what that does is it lets the farm not be reliant on based fertilizer so we can actually use the byproduct of this whole uh, program. Uh, one of the things that kind of sets our program apart from others is that we have a depackager. Um, this kind of came about with our partnership with Hanford. If you think about a lot of food that you see when you go into a grocery store, um, it's in cans or it's in plastic jugs or you know, yogurt containers or juices. Um, say then we get a big winter storm and we lose our power and basically everything gets ruined because the refrigeration and the freezing capabilities have all shut down. So a lot of times um, now we have this and we can actually take all that material from all of our partners who work with food banks, food banks, big production facilities, um, and Hanford and Walmart all have these types of uh, waste products as well. Um, that really increases what we can take out of the waste stream but when we head into the eco-main for uh, consideration, we can pull that out and we run that material straight through this packaging machine like in that bottom left picture. Um, we can scoop it all up with the regular clean food waste and put it right through this big, it's essentially a big horizontal auger with paddles and blades that separates the food from the packaging. It slurries up the food that gets pumped over to the digester and then the packaging ends up in a We've got a bigger um, container there now, but basically it's just kind of shredded in plastic and other, you know, maybe some metals. And that we then take back to the domain. So it's a much lighter, smaller volume than we would normally be considering. So it works out really well. Um, you know, we, we basically, it's kind of interesting with digestion. You can really take a huge amount of uh, variety of things. It's uh, another question back there was sort of a wide, a wider array. With digestion, you can take liquids and solids. Um, it'd be hard to spread liquids onto a compost pile, so that's sort of one of the things where we have a niche. Is, uh, we work with the biofuel companies, we work with uh, big production facilities that have fats, greases, and oils, and like harbor food in Portland we work with. Um, and um, we even work with the airports and, uh, area taking their de-icing fluid, which is one of those materials um, that I would never have thought that we could take, but it's actually not a super toxic chemical, it's actually just a natural compound that can be digested. Um, we also work with shipyard and all the big breweries around the state too on their liquid uh, byproducts. So it's kind of neat, we've been trying to um, really capture as much of the food waste as we possibly can to help Maine reach its 50% recycling goal as well as uh, help other states in New England meet their um, regulations that they just put in place. Uh, that's just one of the liquid uh, trucks that we that we use to collect all the waste. One of the neat stories we also work with Oakhurst and, and some of the other dairy uh, uh, milk pr producers. Which is kind of neat we actually make milk on our farm for those companies, so it's a really full circle situation. Um, and that's it, actually. I'm hoping any questions you guys might have.
specialties, you know, these are maybe some things that are a little tougher to, to get and to process in your closing operations. Um, then, you know, we work with, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and some of those areas. There are some other digesters that are starting to crop up, so we have competition down there on that front. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really young working industry, this organics field, and, um, but it's growing really fast. It feels a lot like the Wild West in some ways, which makes it fun, but it's kind Can you of talk hard. a little bit, like some, so some, there are some juniors and seniors in here. What, are there some jobs, what kind of job? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so I certainly am not like a natural salesperson, but if it's you know, I, and I've never had a sales job before in my life. But um, I'm a, I have an environmental background, um, and it's something that I care about. So really, it's not selling widgets; it's more like selling a concept and something that you can do then. So um, I think definitely uh, you know, we hired some folks with environmental studies backgrounds just because they can talk about the issues. It's really more of a consulting role in, in our department versus just go out and sell this product. Um, there are also people who have to run the facility. Um, so uh, we have a lot of humane graduates with engineering degrees. Um, business people, you know, spreadsheet people. You know, we have like our accountant, the keeper, the humane grad, just a few years ago, and he's been excellent. He's really good with numbers. They were really important for the small business. So any chance, you know, it's fun to be a part of a small and fast growing business because you can really make a difference. So I would always encourage if you have any bit of an entrepreneurial interest or spirit in you, it's, it's a fun thing to try. Um, it's not for everybody, but um, that's probably what you know, guys probably speak to at some point too, but it's um, it's a fun stage to be in because you really can make a big impact. Whereas maybe if you're going into a larger, more established company that's been around for a long time, you can still make a difference there too, but it's just a different uh, take care of everything. Is anyone interested in getting into a business or starting their own business when they leave the South Portland or get out of college? I certainly didn't think about starting a business or being in a business when I was in high school, but yeah, you know, <laughs> Can you tell us some of the businesses you work with in South Portland so we can kind of revisit them? Sure. Are excited about that? Yeah, so you know, we work with Hannaford, like I mentioned before, um, a number of the restaurants like Ellesmere Barbecue, um, Saltwater Grill, Farm Stand, Easy Day, uh, I don't know what you can say, Stretch, Toast Bar, 158 Picket, that's just a few. <laughs> but yeah, South Portland's been doing a great job along with Portland. One of the neat things, you know, I've been traveling a lot around New England, and um, you know, even though we don't have any actual uh, mandates in the state to do this with food waste, a lot of businesses and schools um, have just been choosing to do it because they believe in it, they think it's the right thing. I really think Maine's way, way off the charts compared to even, say, Massachusetts, where there's actually a ban in place. It's been in place for the last four years. And it's just everyone's kind of dragging their feet and getting waivers. And it's, uh, I, I really commend me because I really, it's incredible to, you know, to see everyone doing it because it's a great right thing. Um, and there are financial, you know, uh, incentives too. I mean, definitely the way our system works is we tend to be cheaper than craft disposal. So that's an encouraging thing as well for people who are trying to make a business work. So, you know, can't expect everybody who has a small business to just make the right decision and try to keep their business afloat too. So it's helpful to be able to give them both, you know. So it's, um, but yeah, South Portland's been a real leader, especially with this pilot that just happened and is still, you know, kind of finding its way to the next stage. Um, it's fun to, to be living here in this town and we have a great sustainability coordinator, Julie. I think, you know, I'm doing some of the work on the committee that I'm on. It's, it's a really thoughtful city about uh, environmental um, strategies. And what Josh is about to talk about is the solar array that the city's done in conjunction with Revision Energy. Um, I'm excited to hear more about that as a citizen. It shows one of the things, that, one of the many things that South Portland does. It's really impressive. So, you guys should be proud of being in South Portland. Yeah. 
Um, so, what's the limitations with building a um, digester closer to like a city? Because I'm just thinking like um, with like emerging markets in Massachusetts, I feel like if you have a transport of away from Boston, yep. you're using a lot of fuel. And no, there's a lot a great, of trash right there. That's yeah. a great question. It's one that we hear a lot. I mean, it's interesting. Um, the transportation is actually not even a huge piece of it. But the reason why that happens is, so if you saw the, um, uh, the, the, the byproducts, mainly the liquid byproduct. There's millions and millions of gallons that come out of that process. And really, in order to make the model work, you need to have the land base in order to apply that liquid. Um, otherwise, you're paying to have it taken away as an effluent. And even if it was one cent a gallon, it would blow up your business model because it would be something that you the, the one other sort of scenario that you see digesters um, is a uh, municipal wastewater treatment facilities. And actually, um, Lewiston Auburn has a water, has a digester there that we work with where they're kind of sole supplier of material that they bring in outside of just the septage from the cities. Um, and they, they really focus on just, they can only take liquid uh, material, so we slurry it up or we bring in uh, like shipyards yeast waste, we can bring that in, the icing fluid, things that are already liquefied, they can take in and it really helps them kind of keep doing what they need to do in addition to just managing their human waste. Um, but that's really the only other kind of scenario where you see digesters. Couldn't, it'd be hard to just sort of put one right in Boston or Portland because people would freak out for many reasons. But <laughs> Um, Vermont's kind of neat. There are about 18 or 20 um, very small dairy farms around, scattered around through Vermont that have small-scale digesters uh, that mostly just deal with the, the manure that they that they're getting. But they are starting to look into a little bit of the food waste um, side of things. But especially with Vermont actually have a ban for a, they have a regulation in place that's getting stricter and stricter um, over time. So they'll probably come in.
comes from transportation. Another 30% is from heating and cooling our buildings. And then the remainder comes from personal use. This is kind of a confusing graph, but it's really interesting because it shows kind of renewable energy sources on the left and then you know, our traditional non-renewable on the right. The size of the circle is relative to the amount of energy available. The ones on the right, the non-renewables, that's the total energy available. So that 900 tons of coal, if we scrape all 900 tons out of the ground, that's it, we're not making coal. But the renewables on the left, that's the per year amount of available. So you see wind, and biomass, hydro, tides, and the big one there is solar. So you know, the grid of the future is certainly going to be a mix of renewables, but I think it's pretty easy to see what potential we have for solar energy that <coughs> the Earth on every day. And so this one is looking at global solar potential. You know, you think Maine is kind of a snowy, cloudy, cool state, but you know, looking across at global potential, we're on the same plane as, say, the French Riviera, Southern Europe. What that's telling us is that we're actually a really great state for solar. You know, we're not quite as good as those hot zones down by the southeastern U.S. and the tropics. But an interesting thing with solar is it's actually more effective and more efficient in colder temperatures. And so we do have those in Maine. So those, those cold February days, when it's sunny, we have systems that are just cranking out power way more than that same system would be making in the southeastern U.S. And so, you know, solar energy, um, just a quick interview or a quick overview of how it works. The grid tied solar electricity means we don't have any batteries in these systems. The sun hits the solar panels on the roof. That creates DC electricity, and that electricity gets sent through the inverter and converted into AC electricity. That's what our homes and businesses use. That's what the CMP power grid runs on is AC electricity. So it's a solar array on your home, like it is in this diagram. Energy is created, it will be used in real time in your house, and then excess will go back to the CMP grid and you will get a credit. You can use those credits at night, you know, cloudy days, snowy days. That's how you get away from having batteries. If you send power back to the grid and get credited for it, you can then bring power in from the grid and work off those credits. If your solar array is not on the building, like in the case of the South Portland landfill project, all that power goes back to the CMP grid. All of that's credited, and then you can use those credits other accounts. It can be an account anywhere in CMP territory. And that's how South Portland is able to use the power on that one landfill array on the schools and municipal buildings across the city. And kind of one more just quick, you know, how it works is we're looking at what units we talk about when we're talking about solar electricity or electricity in general. And so we have watts, which is the rating of panels here, four 250 watt panels equals 1,000 watts or one kilowatt, we call this a one kilowatt system. And then kilowatt hours is how we measure, we measure energy over time. And so the average household would use 8,000 kilowatt hours per year, and you would need a 6.6 .6 kilowatt solar array. So this is the Highland Avenue landfill. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it either before or after the solar, but it's right down the Greenbelt Trail is all the way back here. And so this is the old landfill. Um, this accepted mostly construction demolition waste, so not the organic waste, but separated out basically old building materials. Were accepted here until the late 80s. It was then capped over and closed. 
basically just been sitting there as you know, kind of an unused, sunny, green field until 2014, when the city conducted a feasibility study. They were thinking, hey, we have this great sunny field, we put solar. So they conducted or had an engineering firm conduct a feasibility study to look at the impact of putting a solar array on this landfill. Because if it is first and foremost a landfill, we want to keep it contained and have the clay caps over the top of it. So anything we put on that can't penetrate that clay cap. So usually we would take it to the field, drive a bunch of steel piles down into it, and build a solar array on top of those. We can't do that here. So the way landfill solar works is we build these big concrete blocks, and we use the concrete block as sitting in place on top of the landfill, and that holds it from the hurricane force winds. We kind of have to design everything around here, and you know, they're looking at in this landfill, hold the array in what we could. So then, you know, between um, you know, getting the approval and then getting all the permitting and financing in place. Construction began in June of 2017. So here, kind of upper left-hand corner, you see those frames and then the freshly poured concrete. So the whole racking system gets built. Huge pump trucks come in and actually pump concrete in and fill these ballasts. Then that sets, you can then start installing panels onto the, the racking. And then finally, we have the electricians that come in, they hang the inverters, that's what you can see in the lower left hand corner, there's three inverters. They're taking that high voltage DC electricity, converting it to AC, and then that AC is going back to the CNC grid. So this is the completed array, uh, completed in October of this past year. Total of 2,944 individual panels in those six rows. And it's the largest municipally owned solar array in the state of Maine. Estimated annual generation from the array is 1.25 gigawatt hours. So earlier I showed the average house uses 8,000 kilowatt hours. So 1.25 gigawatt hours 1,250,000 kilowatt hours, meaning this would produce enough electricity to power 156 homes on an annual basis. In the case of South Portland, this is all going to municipal and school buildings, and in buildings like this use a ton of electricity. So the electricity from this array is going to offset 12% of the power needs of the school and the municipal buildings in the city. So PV arrays have an estimated service life of 25 to 40 years. So we've got a pretty solid time frame. This is just going to sit here you know, quietly producing electricity, uh, you know, reducing CO2 emissions. And you know, that's it's a pretty staggering amount, actually. So 33 million pounds of CO2 in the first 25 years of this array are going to be offset, meaning that CO2 is not going to be burned into fossil fuel. Plan and South Portland is thus offsetting that amount of CO2. And this is certainly the largest in South Portland, and as I mentioned, the largest municipal array in the state of Maine. But South Portland has been doing solar for a long time. Revision founded in 2003, we did our first install in South Portland in 2004, and since then, over 80 homes and many businesses, just including Scratch Bakery, Bangor Savings, and one of the city offices itself have installed solar electricity systems, you know, making the contribution to the environment, lowering CO2 emissions, and honestly saving folks money. You know, in the long term, this is a more cost-effective way of producing electricity. South Portland the city has set a sustainability goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions citywide through energy efficiency, conservation and renewable energy initiatives, and planning for resiliency and adaptation of climate change. Um, and it's, it's heartening to see the city taking that stance in addition to local businesses and uh, homeowners. So that's, that's kind of what I have. And, Happy to answer any questions on this 
project here is solar electricity in Maine in general. I'm going to stand on the last presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. I don't blame you. But certainly we'll, we'll be happy to answer anything after the fact here. I, was, I have one question in that um, sure. let you guys know what, what, what are some um, careers in this industry? Because I do internships, so if anyone's interested in juniors and seniors, South Portland offers internships. So saying something out here is like, oh, we're kind of interested in the intern group revision, you know, figure out what happens there. We have a program here in high school, so if you're ever interested in pursuing a career, please come see me. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, um, and it's it's exciting because it really is a growing field. And you know, as we grow as a company and technology grows, it's not just solar electricity; it's electric vehicle charging, it's heat pumps, it's battery storage, and you know, the base of it we need people to install all this stuff. So we have installers and especially electricians who we hire to go to all these businesses and landfills and homes and all these technologies. And of course, we have sales folks, we have engineers, um, you know, we have shop managers. So there's, I come from a technology background, and you know, no interest or experience, I have plenty of interest and no experience in solar electricity, but you know, really we hire passionate people. And that's that's key people that share our mission to reduce uh, New England's dependence on fossil fuel. And Well, I certainly appreciate everybody's attention. Hopefully you take something away from here, go back, talk to your parents about it, your friends. I think that, again, the city of South Pole is doing pretty impressive. Um, I do think that, I know sometimes I remember living here and being like, oh, I can't wait to go to Maine, but I also come back and appreciate like, what South Pole has to offer as well. So um, thanks once again. Let's give these guys a hand. Mr. Lamar, can we stay? You can.